the president. The president is the chief executive of the United States. <clears throat> he is the chief of state as well, meaning the symbolic leader of the nation. He also has responsibility for agenda setting. The president is expected to propose legislation and policies. He is the manager of the economy, the chief diplomat. He is the commander in chief of the armed forces. And the president is also his party's leader, whether Democrat or Republican. As chief executive, the president appoints the secretaries of the cabinet, the 15 departments of the federal government, and the heads of other federal government agencies. He oversees a bureaucracy of over 4 million employees, and the Constitution obligates the president to see that the laws be faithfully executed. The role of chief of state is very important as to the president of the United States. The chief of state is the symbol of the United States and acts as the leader and role model of our people. The responsibilities of being chief of state including, include making patriotic speeches, entertaining foreign leaders, awarding medals to outstanding members of the community, and promoting charitable and worthy causes. The president has the chance to define the nation's agenda in an annual State of the Union message. He also submits a budget proposal for the entire federal government to Congress and lobbies congressional members to support or oppose pending legislation. The president also signs legislation into law or vetoes it. And nowadays, presidents often accompany uh, signing up legislation into law with a signing statement. This is a written message that the president issues upon signing a bill into a law and it directs executive departments in how to implement a law. The president as manager of the economy can influence tariff and tax policy, can establish the regulatory environment, can appoint the chair of the Federal Reserve Board, Federal Reserve sets interest rates for banks that are charged for loans, affecting other interest rates for private individuals and businesses. The president is the chief diplomat. The president creates and administers foreign policy, negotiates treaties and other international agreements, and can make executive agreement, agreements. This is an international agreement between the US and other nations, not subject to Senate approval, and not binding on future presidents. The president appoints ambassadors to other nations, hosts state dinners, and receives ambassadors from other nations. The president is the commander in chief. As commander in chief, he is the supreme military commander of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard. He decides when to send troops into battle, although only Congress can declare war. The president sets military strategy. Only one sitting president has ever commanded troops in the field. That was George Washington during the Whiskey Rebellion. The president is the symbolic leader for members of his or her party. The president selects the national party chair, serves as the party's premier fundraiser, and at the end of his term usually campaigns on behalf of the party's new presidential nominee. There are various sources of presidential power. Expressed powers are powers enumerated in the Constitution. Inherent powers are powers that are implied in the Constitution. The vesting clause says the executive power shall be vested in a, in a president of the United States of America. Another clause in the Constitution that refers to, directly to the president says he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. In addition to these, presidents have statutory powers. These are powers explicitly granted to presidents by congressional action. There are special presidential powers called executive orders, emergency powers, and executive privilege. 
Article 2, Sections 2 and 3 of the Constitution describe the President's express powers. These are to serve as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, appoint heads of the Executive Departments, Ambassadors, Supreme Court Justices, people to fill vacancies that occur during the recess of the Senate and other positions, pardon crimes except in cases of impeachment, make treaties with two-thirds consent of the Senate, give State of the Union addresses to Congress, convene the Congress, receive ambassadors for other, of other nations, and commission all officers of the United States. This president's three special, executive, uh, special presidential powers that I mentioned earlier are executive orders, emergency powers, and executive privilege. Executive orders means the power to issue orders that have the force of law. Emergency powers are the broad powers exercised during times of national crisis. Executive privilege is the right of the chief executive and members of the administration to refuse to disclose confidential conversations or national security information to Congress or the courts. An executive order is a directive used by the president to manage operations of the federal government. Executive orders are subject to judicial review and may be overturned if the orders lack support by statute or the Constitution. Executive orders have the force of law, direct the enforcement of congressional statutes or Supreme Court rulings, enforce specific provisions of the Constitution, and create or change the regulatory guidelines or practices of an executive department or agency. Only the President of the United States can issue an executive order. Presidential executive orders, once issued, remain in force until they are canceled, revoked, adjudicated, unlaw adjudicated unlawful, or expire on their own terms. The president may revoke, modify, or make exceptions from any executive order, whether the order was made by the current president or a predecessor. The U.S. Supreme Court has held that all executive orders must be rooted in Article II of the U.S. Constitution or enacted by the Congress in statutes. Article II of the United States Constitution gives the president broad executive and enforcement authority to enforce the law and to manage the resources and the staff of the executive branch. Article II says, the executive power shall be vested in the President of the United States of America, and he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. The ability to, the ability to make such orders is also based on expressed or implied acts of Congress that delegate to the President some degree of discretionary power. The first executive order was issued by George Washington on June 8, 1789. It instructed the heads of the federal departments to impress me with a full, precise, and distinct general idea of the affairs of the United States in their fields. Until the early 1900s, executive orders were mostly unannounced and undocumented and seen only by the agencies to which they were directed, except for William Henry Harrison, all presidents since George Washington in 1789 have issued executive orders. Presidents have generally been careful to cite the specific laws under which they act when they issue new executive orders. When presidents believe that their authority for issuing an executive order stems from within the powers outlined in the Constitution, the order instead simply proclaims under the authority vested in me by the Constitution. Here you see a list of the executive orders, the numbers of executive orders issued for each president before the Civil War. You can see that Franklin Pierce issued the most, the largest number with 35. Between the Civil War and World War II, the person who issued the most executive orders was Franklin D. Roosevelt. 3,721. The person who's pictured here is Theodore Roosevelt, his distant cousin. Theodore Roosevelt issued 1,081 executive orders, which was the largest number at that time. Woodrow Wilson also issued quite a few executive orders, 1,803. 
Since World War II, Harry Truman has, is, has issued the largest number of executive orders, with 907. So you can see in this table, the number of the president who issued the most executive orders was Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, shown on the right. In second place was Woodrow Wilson. Behind him was Calvin Coolidge, and then Theodore Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, and Harry Truman. One of the most famous and important executive orders in American history was the Emancipation Proclamation, which said that on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them and any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. Executive Order of 6102 was also a very important and interesting executive order. It was signed on April 5th by 1933 by Franklin Roosevelt and it forbid the hoarding of gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates within the continental United States. The executive order was made under the authority of the Trading with the Enemy Act of 1917, as amended by the Emergency Banking Act in March 1933. Executive Order 6102 required all persons to deliver on or before May 1, 1933, all but a small amount of gold coin, gold bullion, and gold certificates owned by them to the Federal Reserve in exchange for $20.67 per ounce. One of the most unfortunate executive orders was Executive Order 9066. It was signed and issued during World War II by Franklin D. Roosevelt on February 19, 1942. It authorized the Secretary of War to prescribe certain areas as military zones clearing the way for the incarceration of nearly 120,000 Japanese Americans during the war. Two thirds of them were US citizens born and raised in the United States. This order was upheld by the Supreme Court in a case called Korematsu versus United States, which was decided in 1944. President Harry Truman's Executive Order 10340 placed all of the country's steel mills under federal control. It was overturned by the Supreme Court in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company v. Sawyer in 1952 because it attempted to make law rather than to clarify or to further a law put forth by the Congress or the Constitution. Executive Order 9981 was signed by President Harry Truman on July 26, 1948. This executive order established the President's Committee on Equality of Treatment and Opportunity in the Armed Forces and said, It is hereby declared to be the policy of the President that there shall be equality of treatment and opportunity for all persons in the armed services without regard to race, color, religion, or national origin. Another interesting executive order was Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, better known by its acronym DACA. This was an executive branch memorandum that was announced by President Barack Obama on June 15, 2012. It created a new immigration policy that allowed some individuals with unlawful presence in the United States after being brought to the country as children to receive a renewable two-year period of deferred action from deportation and become eligible for an employment authorization document or work permit. To be eligible for the program, recipients cannot have felonies or serious misdemeanors on their records. 
DACA does not provide a path to citizenship for recipients. In November 2014, President Obama announced his intention to expand DACA to cover additional undocumented immigrants. Homeland Security then released two memorandums directing the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Bureau to make aliens who lacked criminal histories the lowest priority for removal and to grant deferred action to illegal immigrants who are the parents of a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. DAPA, when combined with DACA, would have delayed the deportation of slightly less than half of the 11 million undocumented aliens in the United States. Over half the undocumented aliens eligible for the president's delayed deportation live in California, Texas, and New York. Two weeks later, Texas, joined by 26 other states, sued in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas. DAPA was blocked by an evenly divided U.S. Supreme Court in United States versus Texas, which was decided in 2016. In September 2017, the Trump administration announced a plan to phase out DACA. The government deferred implementation of this plan for six months to allow Congress time to pass legislative protection for undocumented immigrants. Congress failed to act and the time extension expired on March 5, 2018. Three separate U.S. District Courts ordered an injunction preventing the phase out of DACA by this date on the likelihood that the rescinding was arbitrary and capricious under the Administrative Procedure Act. On June 18, 2020, the Supreme Court ruled against the Trump administration's attempt to rescind DACA, saying that the administration failed to provide an adequate reason for its action as required by the Administrative Procedure Act. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote, we do not decide whether DACA or its rescission are sound policies. The wisdom of those decisions is none of our concern. We address only whether the agency complied with the procedural requirement that it provide a reasoned explanation for its action. On January 20, 2021, President Joe Biden issued an executive order reinstating DACA. Executive Order 13769 lowered the number of refugees admitted to the U.S. in 2017 to 50,000, suspended the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program for 120 days, suspended the entry of Syrian refugees indefinitely, directed some cabinet secretaries to suspend entry of those whose countries did not meet adjudication standards under U.S. immigration law for 90 days, and included exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis. The Department of Homeland Security listed those countries who did not meet adjudication standards as Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Critics called this order the Muslim ban. Over 700 travelers were detained and up to 60,000 visas were provisionally revoked. A, statewide, a nationwide temporary restraining order was issued on February 3, 2017 in the case Washington v. Trump, which was upheld by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Consequently, the Department of Homeland Security stopped enforcing portions of the order and the State Department revalidated visas that had been previously revoked. President Trump signed new orders, Executive Order 13780, and Presidential Proclamation 9645 that superseded Executive Order 13769. On June 26, 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the third Executive Order, Presidential Proclamation 9645, and its accompanying travel ban in a 5-4 to four decision. On June 20, 2021, President Joe Biden revoked Executive Order 13780 and its related proclamations with Presidential Proclamation 10141. The Constitution does not expressly grant the President additional war powers or other powers in times of national emergency. 
Some think that the Constitution implies these powers because the structural design of the executive branch enables it to act faster than the executive branch, than the legislative branch. Because the Constitution is silent on this issue, the judiciary cannot grant these powers to the executive branch when it tries to wield them. The federal courts will only recognize a right of the executive branch to use emergency powers if Congress has granted such powers to the president. In the National Emergencies Act of 1976, Congress empowered the president to activate special powers during a crisis. It imposes, the law imposes certain procedural formalities when invoking such powers. Congress can terminate an emergency declaration with a joint resolution. Congress has delegated at least 136 distinct statutory emergency powers to the president, each available upon the declaration of an emergency. 13 of these require a declaration from Congress. The remaining 123 are assumed by an executive declaration with no further congressional input. Executive privilege is the power of the president and other officials in the executive branch to withhold certain forms of confidential communication from the courts and the legislative branch. The Constitution is silent on the executive power to withhold information from the courts or Congress. The privilege is rooted in the separation of powers doctrine that divides the power of the United States government into legislative, executive, and judicial branches. When executive privilege is invoked, the courts weigh its applicability by balancing competing interests. In a case called United States versus Nixon, which arose during the Watergate scandal, this, this case established that even a president has a legal duty to provide evidence of one's communications with his aides when the information is relevant to a criminal case. In that case, the Supreme Court ordered the president to turn over to Congress recordings of private conversations that he had with his aides. Public approval is an important source of presidential powers. Teddy Roosevelt, you see pictured here, referred to the president's bully pulpit, which he meant using the presidency as a forum to speak out on issues. Public approval is an import, is something that a popular president can use to persuade members of Congress to support his positions. Presidents tend to be more popular during something called the honeymoon period. This is early in a president's administration and is usually characterized by public approval. Much of a president's uh, power in terms of public approval depends on his approval ratings. This is the percentage of respondents who say they approve or disapprove or strongly approve of the way the president is doing the job. The imperial presidency is a term coined by Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. to describe the enormous powers of the modern executive branch. He, termed, he coined this term to talk about the power that he saw growing the executive branch during the FDR administrations and into the LBJ administration in the 1960s. Impeachment is a check on the abuses of presidential power. The power of the House of Representatives to formally accuse the president and other high-ranking officials of crimes is impeachment. Article 2, Section 4 says the president, vice president, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. If a majority of the House votes to impeach the president, they forward the charges against the president called the Articles of Impeachment to the Senate. The Senate then tries the president. If it determines him guilty, the Senate can remove the president from office. Here you see a picture of the four presidents, four presidents uh, who are typically talked about during 
impeachment scandals or impeachment controversies. One of these was not actually impeached. Richard Nixon was never impeached. He resigned before he could be impeached. The others, Andrew Johnson, Bill Clinton, and Donald Trump, were all impeached and then acquitted in the Senate, and so they all kept their jobs. The 25th Amendment defines what happens when the president cannot continue to serve in the office. Section 1 of the amendment says, in the case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. Whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority of vote of both houses of Congress. Now there's also a mechanism for removing the president whenever he or she is physically or mentally unable to continue in the job. This is in section three, which says whenever the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate, and the Speaker of the House of Representatives has written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the Vice President as Acting President. Presidential succession, uh, when the President dies or is removed from office, is given according to the following chart. So the vice president is number one in line, and the speaker of the House of Representatives is number two, the, speak, the president pro tempore of the Senate is number three, and then so on. At the State of the Union address, one cabinet member is chosen to stay behind at the White House so that if a catastrophe occurs during the address, someone in the line of succession will be able to assume the duties of the president. John Nance Garner, the vice president from 1933 to 1941 under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, said the vice presidency isn't worth a pitcher of warm piss. He may have been right. The vice president is a traditionally weak role. It does not have many formal powers or responsibilities. The most important part of being vice president is first, being first in line to succeed to the presidency if something should happen to the president. Second, vice presidents perform ceremonial activities like attending state dinners, visiting foreign nations, and the funerals of foreign dignitaries. Third, they sometimes act as a legislative liaison with Congress. And fourth, vice presidents are often picked to balance the ticket in elections. Presidential candidates select a vice president to achieve regional, ideological, ethnic, or gender balance on their campaign ticket. The cabinet is a group of people chosen by the president to serve as advisors and as heads of the 15 executive departments. President Washington's cabinet included the heads of only four departments, Justice, State, Treasury, and War. Today, the 15 departments are Agriculture, Commerce, Defense, Education, Energy, Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, Housing and Urban Development, Interior, Labor, State, Transportation, Treasury, and Veterans Affairs. And the Attorney General is also part of the cabinet. Presidents can include others in the cabinet if they wish. The executive office of the president is the offices, councils, and boards that help the president to carry out day-to-day -day responsibilities. There are three parts of the executive office of the president, the White House office, the National Security Council, and the Office of Management and Budget. The White House office develops policies, protects the president's legal and political interests. It is led by a chief of staff. This is an advisor to the president and manager of the White House office. The press secretary is the president's spokesperson and is also an important person of the White House office. The White House counsel is the president's lawyer and is also a member of the White House office. 
The National Security Council advises the president on key national security and foreign policy decisions and assists in the impl implementation of those decisions. He, the president chairs meetings, which include the vice president, secretary of defense, secretary of state, secretary of the treasury, and the national security advisor. The national security advisor is an assistant to the president for national security affairs, an advisor to the president of national security policy, and an administrator over day-to-day -day operations of the National Security Council. The Office of Management and Budget is the office that creates the President's annual budget, which is submitted to Congress each January. The director of the OMB has a staff of about 600 career civil servants. The director is often designated a member of the President's cabinet, and it interacts with Congress to try to get the president's, bu president's budget proposal passed. After Congress approves the budget, the OMB manages the budget's implementation by executive departments and agencies to ensure that money is spent on the designated purposes and to prevent fraud and financial abuse.